I'm sure you'd be surprised to learn that Microsoft made or had a hand in making a car stereo. You'd probably be more surprised to know that I had a hand in making it. The device you see behind me is the Clarion 310C, what I believe is the first 32-bit car stereo or in-car entertainment system as we've now come to know them. Just why did Microsoft decide that car stereos were something they should dip a toe into and just what is this odd little device? This is the Auto PC story. So let me take you back to the early 1990s. Microsoft's making money hand over fist. Windows is a hit product, Windows 3, Windows 3.1, and of course Office is riding on its coattails. So with all this cash, the natural thing to do is to hire and expand into new areas. So Microsoft creates the home division and part of that is a whole load of CD titles because CD-ROMs were the latest thing for PCs in the 1990s. So we get things like Explorapedia, but we also get CD titles like Encarta, which is a, essentially a whole encyclopedia on one or two CDs. We also get things like Actimates Barney, which is a sort of a cuddly toy that makes movements didn't really work and of course the infamous Microsoft Bob every product at the time had on its roadmap something Bob like because this was going to be the next revolution in how people interacted with computers so every it was all it was called a social user interface or SUI and that's where Clippy comes from in Microsoft Word that annoying thing that uh, everybody made jokes about even Expedia was a venture that Microsoft created at this time and of course that then got spun off into its own company. I was part of this expansion. Microsoft bought the UK company that made Autoroot, which then became known as Expedia Streets and Trips in the USA. Microsoft were throwing everything at the wall to see what stuck and obviously, you know, not, they're not expecting everything to be successful, but maybe some of them will. So I arrive in Microsoft in February of 1995 and literally a month later Microsoft does a deal with DreamWorks to make a game studio, DreamWorks Interactive. And our division head announced this to the teams in the lobby. There was about 200 people of us. We all came down to the lobby and she announced the whole deal to us and potentially some of us could go and work at that team. And she brought along with her David Geffen, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and of course Steven Spielberg from DreamWorks. And because this was just the most amazing thing to see. It was a crazy time. And these were heady days for Microsoft. But what about the Windows product? What could they do with that? Well, Microsoft, of course, would keep expanding it with Windows 95 and Windows 98. But they would also make it more robust for businesses with Windows NT they'd also look to shrink it down to more mobile devices and that's where a team was spun off to work on this small OS which would become Windows CE. Officially CE doesn't stand for anything but compact edition seems to make sense to me. Okay they've made it, making this operating system but what devices would run Windows CE? Well the first device they targeted was something that UK customers would be very familiar with Scion had been making these small clamshell PDAs since 1991 and so Microsoft went and targeted a similar thing to that. With Microsoft's success on the desktop, hardware manufacturers were keen to get in on the ground floor with C's potential new success. So desktop PC companies such as Compact created handheld PC devices. I suppose they were hoping they were going to be companions to the desktop PC. They were more clunky than the sign equivalents, but they got the job done. They were fairly good devices for, for what they were. A Microsoft team was spun up to create the handheld PC specific code. In fact, if you've played Hearts on the handheld PC, and I know that you haven't because it was on the expansion pack, which I'm sure nobody bought. Anyway, the computer players in that are actually the names of some of the team members who worked on the project. These were the days when Microsoft coders could put in little Easter eggs in the program before the lawyers took over, but also before they discovered that in Excel 97, the coders had put in a whole flight simulator as an Easter egg, of course taking up a whole load of space on the disk. 
The handheld PC came out, but at the same time, Microsoft was also looking at another product category, uh, something called the Palm Size PC. And so another team was spun up doing that. The Palm Size PC would turn into the Pocket PC in the early 2000s. It was a portrait uh, PDA, a personal digital assistant that competed with the Palm Pilot. It would turn into a usable phone in the mid 2000s before being made irrelevant like all phone devices were by the iPhone in 2007. They tried to fight back by reinventing it as the Windows Phone. They actually basically rewrote everything. Uh, but of course, we all know how badly that ended for Microsoft. But this isn't what you want to learn. This is uh, sort of all background. What about the third thing that Microsoft created, the Auto PC? Well, they spun up a third team because every car has a car stereo, but these were very simple devices in the 1990s with either discrete logic or at best a four bit processor. They were really just a cassette radio or a CD radio and that was all you got. So what could a Windows CE capable computer do in the car? Very quickly, the team decided that they weren't going to look at the ECU, the brains of the engine. They were really gonna focus on the in-car entertainment side of it. Computers, and especially Windows computers at the time, regularly crashed. The team and Microsoft lawyers were keen not to have cars crash because of their software crashing. I joined the Auto PC team in 1996 when there were only six people working on it. We met in very small uh, team rooms. But soon the team grew and included a hardware team that was building a reference hardware design. This was very important because the companies that made car stereos had almost no knowledge about how to make a computer, a, a complex 32-bit computer. So the reference design would show them how to make this sort of thing. And it also came in handy for Microsoft when they worked on the Ford Sync system because they had knowledge how to build something with a very small bill of materials cost, how to make something very cheap. But going back to the Auto PC in the late 1990s, this device would have a 256 by 64 by 8 color screen. And this reminded me of coding for the ZX Spectrum in the 1980s. It had a similar width and it had, of course, the same amount of colors. It used Hitachi's Super H SH3 32-bit CPU and the follow-up, the SH4, will be used for Sega's Dreamcast, which also used Windows CE. It would have a massive 8 megabytes of RAM and a compact flash slot to install programs and also infrared, which wasn't that useful, but it was something that we inherited from the handheld PC and palm sized PC products. It would also integrate new technologies such as USB, which was brand new at that point. But the big standout feature for the Auto PC would be it would be controlled by speech. This was seen as a game changer because it's so easy to get distracted while you're driving. And in fact, the tagline for the marketing team for the Auto PC was it would allow you to keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. There would be either a wake up button to allow you to speak near the steering wheel or there was a special wake up word. But this was the late 1990s and speech was limited. You couldn't just say anything. It only had eight megabytes of RAM and eight megabytes of ROM. So there were just 200 discrete words that were picked and were trained with American voices. The first wake up word was nomad. And like current speech control devices, the wake up word was picked as something that wasn't common to say and didn't sound like something else. But my British colleague who worked opposite me couldn't make the device wake up with the word because of course it was trained for American voices. So he kept shouting nomad at the thing and even tried the American version, nomad with this sort of you know, fake American accent and it just wasn't working. He was getting more and more irate. So while working with the auto route team, I'd created a way of sharing GPS data between different applications. So I was given the job of making a simple navigation application to write. It was a very basic application and didn't even rely on GPS and it was basically almost useless, but um, a navigation app takes a lot of people to write and there was just me and another person so we didn't really have a lot of resources so we did what we could and it was this was this was early days of navigation. 
Microsoft pitched the concept to many car makers and car stereo makers, but there was only one taker, Clarion. Microsoft were keen to say that they wanted their badging all over it. There was going to be you know, the Windows logo on different buttons and things like that. And third parties just laughed at Microsoft. They said, well, we can't even get our name on the on the product and with a third party making it for the car manufacturer. So you're, you're just making the operating system. There's no way you're going to get anything on this device. So Microsoft was discovering that car makers owned the market. Car companies told third parties how a car stereo should look and they just made it that way. We were moving away from the standard one DIN interchangeable system because of car theft and into customized units that fit only in that particular car. And that of course worked very well for the car manufacturers because it meant that people couldn't swap and change. Slowly the operating system came together and the Clarion 310C will be shown at the Consumer Electronics Show or CS in 1998. And I think it was January 1998. Microsoft didn't have enough people to demonstrate it, so they drafted in all the developers who'd worked on it to give quick five minute demos. What we would do is we would sit in the driver's seat and we'd have three other people in the car and we'd demonstrate the auto PC and showed how it worked. The demos only lasted five minutes as the software was so unstable, that's basically as long as each demo could go, and then we would reboot the device after every single demo just to make sure it didn't crash or do anything weird in the middle of a demonstration. Next. Go to. Radio. Next. Disc player. The Auto PC was shown at the main convention center where all the computer devices and things like that were shown because that's where Microsoft booth was. But most car stereos were shown at the SANS convention center, which was about a mile away. And they were shown on the second floor. On the first floor was the show for the sex industry. And your ticket could get you into both shows. But of course, we only went into the second floor where we saw the car stereos, of course. Here's a quick demo of the Clarion 310C Auto PC. The one I'm showing here, I think is a production unit, but the faceplate isn't a production faceplate. This is a pre-production faceplate. I also have another Auto PC, which is a pre-production model, but it doesn't work. It just continually reboots and doesn't work. So I've swapped to this one, which is the only other one that I've got, which is sort of working. And another problem with it is, is that on the faceplate, the menu and the voice memo, the V memo buttons are reversed. This might be when it was taken apart and someone put the buttons in the wrong order. I think that's probably what the problem was. Although this auto PC works, there are one or two problems with this one as well. The main problem being that the CD drive inside the auto PC doesn't work. You can put a disc in, you can eject it, but it won't read the disc. I do have a CD changer, which is underneath it, so I can put CDs in there and show the CD feature, but you won't be able to see the CD drive working inside the actual auto PC. I've also been having a lot of problems trying to get this auto PC to start up and work. I did have a backup battery and a coin cell battery put in so it was all happy with the different... It, needed, it needs two backup batteries because of the nature of how this thing was put together. It's more the fact that it was a reference design which Clarion essentially copied and so it, it, it's a bit over engineered, but it has two backup batteries. But when I changed the backup battery and I changed the coin cell battery, then the thing stopped working. So I put it back the way it was and it's working and I don't want to touch it. This may be the last time I'll be able to use this device because it's really on its last legs. It's not working very well. Anyway, so if you press the power button, it will tell you. The backup battery and the coin cell battery need attention. So obviously the auto PC has text to speech. It also has a speech feature. And there's two ways you can operate the speech feature. One is the push to talk button, which I have sort of down here. And I can press that button and then CD player. radio. And you can go to the radio. It's currently off at the moment, but if you press this button here, you can get FM. 
and you can get AM. Let's just turn that off for a second. But another way you can use speech is by using the wake up word. And that was going to be nomad before we didn't know what we were going to call this device, but eventually it got replaced with the word auto PC. So hopefully I'll be able to wake it up and be able to do something with it. Auto PC. Auto PC. Radio. What time is it? 2.29 yeah. p.m. You have to use a slight American accent to make it work, as I've pointed out before. So the radio, it was a basic radio that worked the same as most radios at the time. It has FM, AM, you can control it with different presets, you can set presets, and the 1 to 0 buttons on the right hand side were the buttons that you would use for the presets. As I mentioned, Microsoft was very keen on using its Windows logo for everything, the Microsoft logo. So the button for the main menu is Radio. this one with a, with a small Windows logo on. And this takes you back to the main menu where you have the radio. Let me just mute this. The radio, a CD, CD player, player, and it'll announce all of these things for us. Directions, address book, audio, setup, messages, voice memo, so there's various different applications and you can add additional applications. You could load additional applications into it. Start. CD player. And so this is playing music from the CD changer. I've tried to pick music, which hopefully isn't going to hit any content matches. I found six discs that hopefully are going to work. So the Auto PC has a help button here and that really provided context sensitive help depending on which application you happen to be in to really show you what you could do with each different application, what speech commands you could use, things like that so you could learn how to use the device because we were aware that this was a, a lot more complicated than your standard cassette radio that you had in your car. So we would have various uh, topics in here that you could go and learn how to, how to do these different things. And you use the left and right buttons to select different tracks. You use the up and down buttons to go to different discs. CD player. Next. Previous. There was one slightly odd feature which you could select specific track numbers and play them through the disc playlist. So if you wanted to only play tracks 1, 3 and 5 for example, then you could select the ones you wanted to play and then when you press next it would only play tracks 1, 3 and 5. I'm not sure whether anyone would really use this feature but these were the early days of car computers and we had the ability to do all kinds of things with the device and so somebody, some program manager felt it was important to add that feature in. So the next application I want to show you is Directions. And this is an application I wrote with another person. There is an Easter egg in this application, but I've forgotten how to access it. I think it's something to do with typing in a certain certain address as a start address, and then it would give you the, the, the gang screen of the people who'd made it. I don't think the application used GPS. It showed a list of directions when you'd calculated the route, and then you had to physically move to the next set of instructions when you were actually at that turning point. And so it didn't really use GPS, it just gave you a list of directions. It was very, it was a very, very basic system. And of course, with a small device like this with so few buttons, it's very difficult to enter the start and destination addresses. These are also really times before we did the T9 predictive text thing. So it was really just a lot of up and down and enter to try and select different letters. It took, just took a long time to enter um, text information. Another way of doing it would be to use on your handheld PC, you could install the Pocket Streets application and then you could put an address in there and then you could take that address and you could infrared squirt send it to the auto PC. I'm not sure anyone 
ever did that, but it was certainly an option. And it was really the team trying to work out what is an easier way for us to try and get text input into this device, but obviously we hadn't solved that problem at the time. Unfortunately, this application doesn't work. I need a navigation setup disk to get it working. I believe I do have a navigation setup disk. Unfortunately, the CD drive doesn't work, so I can't actually install it and get it to work. So the next application is a dress book. There was really an idea at some point that the, this device was going to work with phones and so you could somehow call numbers while you're driving. And this is the days before Bluetooth or any technology like that. Nowadays, if you want to make a phone call in a car, it's a very simple process, particularly with uh, voice operation. And this was really a first attempt to try and do it. And we didn't have the phone integration, so the address book wasn't a lot of use. However, the handheld PC and palm sized PC had address books in them, so you could use the technology from that in this auto PC. You could also use your handheld PC or palm sized PC to send contacts and addresses from there using infrared. But entering new contact entries manually was a, a real game. So you could only use the up down controls as I showed here. One nice feature is, is if you go down, you get the lowercase, but it's, it's a lot of trouble just trying to get everything done. So briefly, there are a few other apps. There is audio that just allows you to change audio settings. You can change different presets and things like that. And Audio. moving on, setup. we've got setup. I'm, I did the setup application. It's essentially, it's the control panel from, uh, from your PC, but it's just changed for this new user interface. You can do various things with it, but um, lots of just basically setting things up. Setup, messages. The messages app was an interesting one. This was something which was a Clarion specific application and you would need an optional wireless receiver to receive traffic information, news, and also emails. It was presumably, presumably some subcarrier or texting or something like this that was sending this information through the system. I don't know very much about it because we never really were part of that, but there was a way of doing something with that. Messages, voice memo. So finally, there's a voice memo application and Again, this, this is where the voice memo and menu buttons being opposite is a bit confusing. But if you press the voice memo button, which of course is this one, then you can record a voice memo. This is a voice memo. This is a voice memo. There was an assist button, which I think is also called the Mayday button, maybe on the final device. And this was another Clarion feature which we weren't a part of. And it was really Clarion trying to make something similar to General Motors' OnStar service, which was becoming popular in the late 90s. It provided emergency and roadside assistance, vehicle security monitoring and tracking, remote door unlock. I'm not quite sure how they would do that with an aftermarket device, but whatever. Apparently they said that they could do that. Operator assisted directions and points of interest. So there was another way of maybe adding additional features to the Auto PC, but I'm not really aware of that. Clarence Auto PC sold very poorly. I don't have specific numbers, but it sold very badly. And for $1,800, which is $3,300 today, or about £2,700, it wasn't cheap. And that was before you added the GPS module and additional navigation software from a third party that made it actually work properly and you had to have someone to take out your old car stereo and fit this new one into your car, which costs hundreds of dollars more. Presumably Clarion had already been working on a V2 product and had that in the works before the V1 product shipped, because even though the original Auto PC did so badly, they still released a V2 product. And it was called Joyride, and it was essentially the same product, but it had a DVD drive so it could play DVD movies, it had a larger screen so it could show those. 
but I think it did about as badly as the original device. It also didn't help that the name Auto PC was close to the word autopsy. <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't really bode well for the product, I suppose. But you'd think that after selling so poorly, Microsoft would abandon the in-car entertainment space. But the goal was always to work with car manufacturers. That was where the money lay. And they knew that one aftermarket supplier was never going to make a lot of money. And any venture that Microsoft did at this time had to make a lot of money or it wasn't worth doing. The Clarion Auto PC was always a proof of concept to get their name known. And the Microsoft automotive team that was making it was actually cash positive at the time because a bunch of third parties were using the core Windows C code without any of the automotive code to build their own in-car entertainment solutions. We of course had nothing to do with it, but the revenue went into our cost center. It would take until the early 2000s until the Microsoft automotive team got the Fiat Blue and Me deal that led to Ford Sync. The Auto PC was born from a company that was flush with cash and thought that they could take their dominance in Windows and expand it to other markets. They found that companies were wary that Microsoft would come to dominate their industry and so they were unwilling to work with us. And of course, I'm not blind to the fact that the Auto PC wasn't a very good product. But it shows the team was on the right track and it was a product that was built before its time. The CPU was too slow, it didn't have enough memory and it lacked standards such as Bluetooth. Once speech technology became better, CPUs became faster, memory became cheaper and the Microsoft team learnt how in-car products should be made, they finally came good with Ford Sync. If you want to hear more about what happened next, I have a video about Ford Sync on the right. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.